Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. Epiphany of Our Lord is always on January 6th, and in 2024, that happens to be a Saturday. And the texts are Isaiah 60, 1 through 6, Psalm 72, verses 1 through 7, and then skipping ahead to verses 10 through 14, Ephesians 3, 1 through 12, and Matthew 2, 1 through 12. We have a separate podcast on Baptism of the Lord for January 7th, which is a Sunday, but some of you might want to do Epiphany texts on that day. You are free to do so. And it's 2024. If I still wrote checks, I would probably be writing the wrong year on them. <laughs> yep, exactly. Wow, can't believe it. Hmm. A... So oh. Epiphany, new season, and... The well, Magi, who are always fun to have on the stage. Well, and that's worth just pausing for a minute and saying, okay, Epiphany. Uh, and so, and then we'll, after baptism of our Lord, move into the season of Epiphany. So it's, it, we say this, I think, every time, but that shift to a new uh, new liturgical season and and to reflect on where your preaching has led to that and what you can draw on that that helps people make that connection. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how many people contemplate the seasons of the liturgical year on a regular basis. So, <laughs> uh, what difference does this make? What does this mean? Uh, and yeah, making those connections. So not that the whole sermon is about that, but yeah. Well, in some cultures, epiphany matters more than Christmas in terms mm -hmm. of, um, celebration and even gift giving and mm -hmm. national holidays, Trace Reyes, you know, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. and baptism of our Lord in some cultures, Christian traditions is the thing. So it comes down to exactly what, what becomes central for us in terms of how we mark time. Um, uh, this, this is uh, by having a different calendar, we're actually noting that, um, we mark time differently because Christ has come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I say this as somebody who, in my tradition, this is always the, I really ought to start going to the gym season. That's what epiphany is for me. But <laughs> Oh, I, uh, is it too oh, no. early to say epiphany for me is the realization that I'm not going to keep that particular <laughs> resolution? <laughs> oh, I thought you meant that gift. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to return the sweater. No, but seriously, <laughs> folks. I it only me. takes me six days to go. Well, that wasn't a good plan. I go yeah. every morning, so I don't have that. And everybody yeah, you're now, good. Everybody now is like, oh. oh. Yeah, you're so I good. Knew there was some reason I didn't like Caroline Lewis. Anyway, uh, I uh, here's here's one thing I have on general epiphany, and then uh, and then I have an idea about the text. But the first thing is, when you look ahead at the Epiphany text that will uh, come up, uh, we have the calling of the disciples in John 1, well, the finding of the disciples of John 1, for, uh, John 1, 43 through 51. And then third Sunday after the Epiphany is the calling of disciples in Mark. And so that made me think that, yes, Epiphany is a season of manifestation, right? A re revealing of who Jesus is and who, who God is through Jesus. But it also with the calling of the disciples made me think about how the, here's the question I, I landed on what needs to be revealed this epiphany, what needs mm -hmm. to be manifested this epiphany and how is it that we will take some responsibility for that? I think, mm -hmm. I don't think we can look at the, here, both of those, calling of the disciples text and say, oh, wow, you know, leave epiphany all to Jesus <laughs> mm. or only what we're, or only what's being revealed about Jesus. But how is it that we are taking some of that responsibility of how, how will be, how will we be manifestations or revelations of who God is of uh, this epiphany? And, and how is it that preachers might answer that for their congregations. This is that here are going, here are, here congregation, here community of faith. This is going to be, these are going to be our epiphanous moments. Uh, mm. This is, or this is what we, this is, this is who we 
manifest, this is what we manifest about who God is in our community and how can we take that on in a more significant way. So that's just, a, that's a general epiphany thought that I wanted do, to share. Do, do we have to say Epiphanus? Epiphanus? No. But I like because I can't. I can't tell you how many times I had to say that in my head to go. Can you say that out loud? I like saying it every year. Yes, I know. <laughs> so, what do we learn from the Magi's visit about what needs to be revealed? Oh well. Oh, that's a good question. Let's yeah, because I have Ooh. a different. I have a different theme for that. Oh gosh. Will you answer it that way or? Well, I would call this sermon our uh, a foiling God. Is that like an is that an adjective or a thwarting God? Uh, mm -hmm. That our what is manifested in this passage is that uh, we have a God who thwarts the plans of of persons who are not uh, of of moments and times that are that might interfere with what what where god is going and so you have in matthew of course the angel of the lord that uh that comes to joseph and says you know you want to do that no we're going to do this and then the in verse 12 having been warned in a dream again of presence of god not to return to herod they left for their own country by another reward uh, road. So the way in which uh, God thwarts the plans of, of um, yeah, persons and events that are, that, that would prevent, right, the unfolding of, of God's redemption and salvation in the world. So that's what I would, we have a thwarting God. We have a foiling God, God who foils, well, that was the, word. foils the plans. That's, <laughs> that's what was manifested to me. Okay, <laughs> which is a really interesting thing to think about homiletically in terms of how, uh, how it will, like going back to some of like New Year's resolutions, like right, we have these all these plans laid out, and then, you know, how often God thwarts our own plans. We make plans and God laughs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of where I was going with this text this year. Love it, love it. I um. I see the echoes um, and uh, the echo here, and, it, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it in the way that you said it, but uh, in reverse. Um, God has a plan and humanity seems to always want to disrupt it. And the ep echoes here are of the story of, of, uh, from Exodus, uh, where in chapter one, uh, there arose a leader who did not know uh, the story of what God was doing through the descendants of Abraham and Sarah. Um, Ralph isn't here to correct my poor reading of uh, the Hebrew here, but that's the story. And um, because of that, uh, Pharaoh, not knowing Joseph, he um, um, began to contemplate all of the dangers that could happen if this, these people were their enemy and made them their enemy. And it's very much echoed in this scene right here, where God is yet fulfilling that promise that was made, uh, the descendants of Abraham, now the descendant of David, um, and the leader who doesn't understand uh, what God is doing or doesn't give place uh, in their leadership uh, for what God is doing in the world and attempts to thwart God's um, uh, God's activity. And you just can't do that. God is faithful. And uh, so um, it's it's what you were saying, but um, in, in reverse, how many times are we the ones that think that we can um, fix, correct, or undo what God seems committed to doing? And the story over and over again says, nope, and I'll use your words now, Caroline. Um, we have the foiling God. Mm -hmm. There's a I, whenever I hear foiling God, I think of God getting his his hair colored, or her hair colored, <laughs> yeah. or their hair colored. That but, reminds um, me. You, you are you anyway, are so not foiling. violent. Don't look. You don't look too close. Not violent. 
I know Don't it can mean many things. Don't at my roots right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um where were we oh yeah i i love the magi story that you know i think one of the things gets revealed here is you might learn something from people who are outside of your circle or outside of your clan or outside of your religion uh, they might see things more clearly than you do at times i think there's something about they're going and giving gifts to the christ child offering worship to the christ child then forces them to make a decision about their allegiance and so they choose, they make, a, they make a choice, right? Being worn in the dream, they choose uh, a courageous decision. They dissent, right? They, um, and that's, there's something about that that I think is important that once you decide that this, this, uh, this newborn child is a king or this newborn child deserves worship, then all of a sudden that's going to make a play or a claim on your political um, loyalties. And maybe the third thing is you probably it's revealed here is you probably should not trust nervous or power hungry politicians who um, who make a play to be religious. Mm, mm. <laughs> right. Herod's thing is, oh, when you find him, let me know. So I'm going to go worship him, too. I mean, I'm not going to say all politicians because that's too cynical. And I know politicians who are not like this. But there's a real warning here about just how deceitful Herod is. Mm -hmm. And Herod is frightened. Herod is, um, I mean, literally it says he's frightened. Uh, and Herod will do whatever he has to do to protect what's his. Yeah, to maintain power. That, yeah. And that's and, what power hungry, nervous people do. Yeah. And he sees religion as a tool, I think, or as, a, as a, an opportunity to, to mm -hmm. get what he wants. Mm -hmm. That just or his own fake piety. How about that? Yeah, 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 yeah. That calls to mind a few people, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Far Surely. too many people in far too many countries. Yeah. yeah. Surely you're going back to Pharaoh. Yeah. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> you can go back and go forward, but you know, it's just we might as well just talk about that. The Bible, and this is true in the Older Testament as well, right? Where when kings are left to do whatever they want to do, they tend to cause great trouble and. Prophets can sometimes pull them back from the brink, but it's usually too late when the prophet shows up. Exactly. Exactly. Speaking of prophets. We could take a look at uh, Isaiah. And uh, um, I was going to make that segue, Matt, when you were saying um, to listen to folks outside of your circle, because that's exactly what is described here, um, that um, nations shall come to your light. Um, and it's not just Israel that is being talked about here, um, but that it extends beyond uh, that, that uh, Caroline, you, what you like to always say, that God is extending beyond those borders of, of you know, um, when you do John 3, uh, 3 and 4, mm -hmm. you know, that God so loved the world. Mm -hmm. And so here it is now in that this prophet is saying, um, that um, the nations shall come to your light. Um, that's that's good news, and that's good news to hear now when the internet and um, um, uh, instant uh, media has brought the world to us so that we can see the world's hungers and the world's hurts and the world's needs. Are we returning the favor mm. by offering the world the hope that we have found in Christ, because that would be how we would respond to the cries of the nation. That's Isaiah for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I think uh, the, just the opening line, arise, shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. That to for me, I think I would use that as a kind of refrain for Epiphany, uh, mm -hmm. that, that the rise shine for your light has come, and and it kind of for me it goes back to what I was suggesting earlier of a kind of reciprocity of Epiphany, that mm -hmm. Epiphany is not just looking for the manifestation of of God and Jesus in our midst, but how is it that we are are manifesting that light for others. And so that 
your 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 standing up arise and shine your light has come but how is it that you are reflecting that light in the world and so that's kind of what i would that, that's what, what i would take from isaiah yeah. connecting it to some of the themes that i already suggested yes yeah and avoiding that trap that would suggest that the light is somehow our own right that this is the exactly. glory of the lord that does yeah. this yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. Mm -hmm. absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, which connects back to some of what things that you were saying Matt, about how, yeah, how we, how, where is that line between shining that light and then making the light your own, mm -hmm. you know, putting the light on you. And mm -hmm. um, it's not, it's, that's not what it is. And so that's important, important corrective. And being that corrective will take us, might take us to the psalm. Uh, and just the recognition that uh, we've, if if you take the time to note uh, the kinds of leaders, administrations, and kings that have not been faithful, that our role becomes to um, pray that God would give the king God's justice. Mm -hmm. And um, that, again, it's our task is to turn to God for God to do what God alone can do. Mm -hmm. And this psalm, I think, uh, I think we're challenged to pay attention to the psalm as a request uh, rather than as uh, instruction. Um, we aren't giving the justice. We're praying that God would give God's justice. Um, because obviously, the, as was mentioned before, um, we have a tendency to give kings too much reign, and maybe what we ought to do is to pray that they would give God, uh, that they would yield to God and have God's justice. Yeah, I, the psalm is is the image of an ideal king, which doesn't exist. It didn't exist anywhere in the Old Testament. Uh, but Fred Geiser also points out in the commentary that he's also a bit of an overlord in this. And so there's a way in which it's, it's the kind of King that we might sometimes long for um, also with this kind of strength. And so there still is a way in which the Psalm is getting rewritten and, and recast when we read it on Epiphany, for example, and imagine Jesus in this role and, and how does that maybe soften some of the harder edges or maybe cause us to redefine some aspects of it. I'm, I'm going to make a connection to my theme with Ephesians, and that is verse 10. So that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So Brilliant. there is a responsibility here of uh, just of us individually, but also as a community. Um, and that's really what I'm hearing this this epiphany. Uh, especially as we move into 2024, uh, and um, and particularly, uh, at least in you know the United States, the realities of of <laughs> of of how people manifest power, and um, and but you know not only in not only nationally and politically, but it just calls attention to how how are we as church leaders and and how is it that people will know the know the graciousness and the and the and the wisdom of God through our through our being and through our actions and through our light shining and so that that's that's the connection that I would make with my theme du jour. Yeah, I appreciate that. Especially you mentioned twenty twenty four, and I I thought you were going to talk about <laughs> the uh, the being a national election year in this country and. Uh, you didn't, fortunately, but I was thinking that well, that's going to be a heck of a year. And and people who are pastors of of so called purple churches, right? People that actually have got folks who vote differently and think differently on in terms of policy and issues know how to do this. They know how to dance on that wire, and and they have a lot to teach the rest of us. But I wonder if there's a way too in talking about the call for reconciliation that we see in Ephesians. That's just kind of a, how are we going to get through this year, right? Or what are we going to, how are we going to do this together? Because we all know the differences among us, but we're also committed to something greater and we're committed to a unity that, that transcends all of that. And so this language of mystery that the author of Ephesians likes so much in this paragraph, you know, it's 
people should know this if you don't know it, at least how the New Testament uses that Greek word mysterion. It's it's never mystery in the sense of you got to know the code to crack it. You got to be really right. smart to figure it out. It's always something that was not previously known that has now come to be revealed in Christ. So the mystery isn't, I hope we figure this out. The mystery is what we've already been grasped by in terms of God's light or God's revelation. And so it's how do we take what we've already know to be true and now manifest this in, in how we live? And that's, you know, mm -hmm. there are other divisions besides what's going on in the United States and our listeners are all over the world. And so it's, it's this idea of what, how does reconciliation actually happen in a world that's so wired, literally wired or programmed to keep us in our own echo chambers? Um, like how do we find places of cooperation with people who are on the other side of a boundary and recognize our common humanity, recognize our common calling, recognize our common, you know, dignity and mission in that. I think, uh, yeah. And I think too, what this passage does in terms of a thinking about epiphany and, and the Epiphanus moments, I had to get that in one more time. Yep, sure. Sure, I'll, I'll come back to it. But it also reminds us that, or it, it calls us to the realization of where and how we control epiphanies or we predict epiphanies <laughs> that uh, God's, uh, God's, uh, God's manifestation, how God manifests God's self. And that is the Gentiles now are fellow heirs and it goes back to your comment Matt, about about the mystery and that you know what are the what are the epiphanies that we have not seen are we open to those epiphanies that are yet that, that we have yet to behold and um how is it that we take on those moments of or how do how is it that we enter into those those moments of surprise and mystery if i dare to say um you know i talk sometimes about this being an ancient wisdom um, uh, as you mentioned, Matt, um, our listeners are around the world. And um, when we read um, Jews and Gentiles, we usually read them in a binary of, you know, one group against the other. But um, this is a story that is written from the perspective of one people, the Jews, and they acknowledge everybody else. So the, so the Gentiles sometimes means absolutely everybody else. And so as we are inviting the, our listeners who are preaching uh, to be attentive to um, how this mystery becomes an invitation to belonging, um, we go back to this sense of the nations uh, coming uh, to uh, uh, see the light, uh, to become bearers of the light. And so this isn't just uh, what's happening in the U.S. This kind of Division is seen across the dinner table and across any particular um, national, uh, political, geographic uh, a, a line. And yet the gospel, the good news, is that those of us who bear the name of Christ are those who are brought together and can have that uh, epithanous moment. Um, uh, and, it might, and it might come from someone um, we least expect who's never been in our clan before. <laughs>